Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to get us started so we can uh, try to maximize the time we have uh, for discussion as we, as we uh, move forward. Uh, so this is the second component of the, of the annual Woldowski Forum, this, this discussion section. Um, and we're very fortunate to, to not only have a, our great speaker, Becky Blank, but to have terrific discussants. Uh, all of whom know, know a great deal about the uh, subject of inequality. Uh, Bob Reich and Steve Raphael from, from our school, and Mike Hout from the Department of Sociology. Um, and so each of them will, will take uh, 10, 10 or 15 minutes to, to uh, uh, give us their reactions to all the work that uh, Becky has done and she presented to us last night in the, in, uh, in the forum. And, um, uh, and after they, they offer their reactions, then we'll give Becky a chance to respond to, to um, what she's just heard. Um, and then we'll open up the floor for whoever wants to comment or ask questions or whatever um, about, about this. So uh, I thought maybe we would start with Bob because uh, I, you're, um, uh, I know you don't you know, you're not feeling it at your absolute best today. Well, but. actually, I was going to suggest, to you, since I've spent yeah. much of the last uh, couple of days in bed, that I be more of a respondent to respondents. Yes. And maybe we start at the other end, and I will yeah. pick up the tail end. That's fine. Mike, would you like to start? I'm, then? I'm ready to go. I put a little yeah. chart up there, okay. so I might as well walk everybody through. Yeah, I put it. I hid it carefully behind your head. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I couldn't get in the way of your head. <laughs> Uh, our identity uh, banner uh, preempts this board, so I put it on the sideboard. Um, and you can see I experimented with color uh, in order to get the right pen. Um, there's, no, there's virtually no uh, information in the color coding other than there's more ink in this one. Um, the, the perspective on this is to try and put um, Becky's presentation last night into a language uh, that sociologists uh, have been playing with uh, symbolic language sociologists have been playing with since the uh, late 1960s. Um, it comes out of work by Blau and Duncan based on the March 62 uh, CPS, and, uh, which included quest a question on uh, father's occupation and father's education, and allowed them to then uh, develop this model of the socioeconomic life cycle, which is the top part of the, uh, of the chart, the, the fading away blue. Um, I, they actually elaborate this. I call it socioeconomic endowment here. That's to be understood uh, to keep the number of arrows and the amount of writing I had to do to, uh, down. That's to be understood as parents, in their day, men, uh, fathers, but uh, these days, both parents, educations, whether or not the, the, you know, the quality of the job they're in and how they combine their assets to produce family income for the family, plus race and uh, socioeconomic, or not socioeconomic, uh, intellectual or uh, uh, some sort of uh, academic ability measure. And those things all then sort of, you know, amass out here, focus in some sort of laser beam hit and produce this latent socioeconomic endowment, which then influences the amount of education a person gets and may have direct effects on the quality of the job and the amount of earnings, but uh, most of that gets mediated by education. Um, and then, and this was, this was really terrific on Becky's part, she makes note of the fact that this individual which has this package uh, may or may not, has it worked here, marry, which then gives the married access to somebody else's stream along that way, which may be a good stream or a bad stream, but it's a stream. And then the two of them combine their earnings to produce family and household income, oh, and you know, then Uncle Sam comes in and a few other things happen. Uh, but for the most part, uh, that's where the family household income comes from. So that's, that's, how, I, uh, that's how I heard uh, the talk and read the paper with, with this flowing through the back of my mind. Now what she shows is that there, these are <coughs> actually behind all of these arrows are regressions and on those regressions are intercept shifts and error terms. 
And what we're interested in, one of the things we're interested in is how much do shifts in these intercepts help explain the growing variance in this thing over here, the final outcome variable. The variance is rising and that's our marker of the inequality. And what she shows is that 15% of the action is in a mean shift away from marriage. So that uh, in 1979 marriage was more common and so the marriage not outcome, I'm not going to call it a choice, I'm not, I'm not an economist, I can call that an outcome, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is explaining about 15%. First of all, it's inducing more variance in ultimate family income because fewer people have access to this other stream and so that mean difference between married people and unmarried people is 15% of the growth in family income 79 to uh, 08. At 07. Oh, seven. Uh, and, um, and then there's another 35% of it, which was tied up in uh, changes in the distribution of jobs. So that these things, these two parts, mean shifts on these two crucial variables are producing about half of the growth in inequality. And the question is, where's the, where, where the other half? And um, there's a lot of work going back to uh, uh, the late 80s. Um, uh, Dick Freeman and, uh, and other people were doing these regressions and Bob Frank wrote a book about it. The, you know, one way of reading the winner take all society is saying that the unexplained variance out here is growing and that's, that's the inequality story. But I don't actually think that that's half. You know, that's, that's a chunk. It's a piece. There's a paper by Christine Pacheski and Bruce Western in the uh, most recent uh, ASR, where they go through a decomposition of all this, and, and wages, not earnings here, but anyway. Um, and uh, they estimate that it's about a third. So now we're down to, uh, you know, half minus a third, you know, where's that last sixth of, uh, of the change? And Becky identified it as skill bias technological change. Uh, I hate that. I mean, not only is it nine syllables and four initials that don't spell anything, but it obscure, it's a term that doesn't explain itself. What is that? Um, here's its consequence. It is boosting every beta that is connected to education. And in work by Christine uh, Schwartz and Rob Mayer, there's even and it, it's not a skill bias, but there is a boost in the association between education of, of married people. So there's even something going on here that is tied to education. I want to call it the college graduate shortage. And Becky hit on why that was last night when she made note of the Golden and Katz analysis of where trends in college going are taking us, um, I actually would make it a little stronger than she did. Um, I'm, I'm going to use this segment of this board over here just to drive. It, it, it does erase, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. He says after he drives the first line. <laughs> really 18 blah 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 to uh, 1977 the fraction of Americans getting a college degree is basically a linear uptick from 7% to 29% of um, of cohorts are, are, are you know this is of young people let's say people 25 to 29, what percentage of them have a, have a college degree? Rises from 7% to 29% and dramatically stops. There's actually a little sag and recovery. Oh, good. But on net, by 2005, there's, we're back to the 29%. We might crest 30%. We might have already crested 30%, but we're not, we're not on this curve anymore. 
And when we break it down by gender, it's even clearer that something is awry because all of the famous gains among women, you know, giving this talk in 1977, the gender ratio in this room would have been substantially different, just as it is in our cohort uh, uh, among, you know, uh, gray-haired professors. But um, women have expanded their share of college graduates famously. Every gain among women has been offset by a loss among men. The best educated cohort of American men is mine, if best is defined as highest fraction getting the college diploma. 31% of us got college degrees. And uh, no other cohort of American men have gotten, have crested the 30% mark. Um, and so men are down, women are up. On net, we sag and recover. It's either the kids, it's, it's young people these days, sex, drugs, and video games, or it's the colleges. And I think that it's the colleges. And there, I've got some evidence of this. I'm not, you know, this is, this is not a place for me to do another paper. I actually did it last week at SRC. But um, the, uh, the, the point of it is that, you know, how, how would we recognize a shortage well, you know, those of us who are in this cohort remember the gas shortages of that time. You know, what, what's it look like? It's harder to get what you need. You pay more for it if you're lucky enough to get it. And you queue up to get it, right? Um, and uh, that describes college application and admission processes in this country pretty well. 70% of kids aspire to go to college, half get in. Now, some don't get in because they had no business applying to begin with, but um, our analysis comparing the high school and beyond data with the, uh, with the NALS 88 data indicate that um, there are a lot of kids who would have gotten in in the early 80s who don't get in anymore based on their grades and test scores. These are big national surveys from the NCES that have grades and test scores, and we can come up with a college admission officer decision point and, and say, these kids would have gotten in in the early 80s, don't get in uh, in the mid 90s. And so the net result is, I think that what it is, is not just a college graduate shortage driving up all of those. Slopes over there, the skill bias technological changes and induced college graduate shortage, and it's induced by our colleges and universities. We quit building them. How did we do this? We built capacity. 1955 to 1970, California built a Cal State a year. Well, almost. In 15 years, they opened 14 Cal States. Since then, we've opened two, both by taking over forks or other institutions that were out there already. We moved in to already built campuses. Um, four UCs, 1955 to 1970. Merced, which is way, you know, 10 years behind uh, projections. Is, uh, is our only accomplishment since then. I'm just going to say, you know, these are public institutions. This is the year of Prop 13. Correlation is not causation, but there is something to be said for the way in which we finance higher education. Henry said it in his discussion last night. We take a number. We take a number behind health care and K-12 and uh, and there's less money to go around, and it has induced the college graduate shortage. So that's my substitute for skill bias technological change. Thank you, Mike. Um, Steve, would you like to? Uh, sure. Take I, a have turn? A, I have a handout that uh, there might be piles in there. Um, I'll just loosely refer to them, but there's some tables and things like that that, that I might talk about. So. Uh, yeah, one up here. I just wanted to, to start by saying that I really enjoyed uh, reading uh, Becky's paper and then the presentation last night. And I learned, you know, quite a bit from the theoretical discussion and just thinking about the ways that various shocks can impact inequality. But I think one of the more surprising things that I learned was uh, the stylized fact regarding the distribution of wages as opposed to the distribution of household income. So in the last 10 years, 
I have literally read hundreds of papers on uh, wage inequality and how wage inequality has changed in the United States. And, and the, the facts are clear to everybody that, that the Gini coefficients have increased or the coefficient of variation or the 90-10 ratio, however you measure it, right? Wage inequality has grown. And there have been absolute declines for people at the bottom. What, what was new to me was the fact that when you looked at household income overall, uh, you don't see patterns that conform to the wage distribution at all. In fact, they look quite different. Uh, that could be driven by a number of things. One, it could be that many people focus on male wages when they study inequality, and it's just be the chauvinism of the economics profession and that they're not looking at women's earnings as well. And usually the way uh, people justify that is they say, well, it's so difficult because there's labor supply trends that are confounding things. But for the most part, it's just overlooked. Um, but, you know, a, a, an, another issue is simply uh, that um, uh, we just focus on wages and we've ignored, we've ignored labor supply uh, to a great degree. And perhaps some of the largest changes that we've observed in the labor market, both for men and women over the last 30 years, have been with regards to labor supply. So with regards to uh, those results, I wanted to make three comments that, that are not meant to be critical, but, but hopefully to maybe think about how we interpret these <coughs> results in terms of people's welfare. And then also, that's the first comment. The second comment uh, is perhaps uh, more of a theoretical comment, to think perhaps about how even if we have uh, rising medians combined with rising inequality, there may be some sort of consumption externalities that operate through big ticket uh, items such as housing that might actually lead to declines in utility among the poorest of the poor. And I wanted to spend a few minutes on that. And then the final thing I'm going to talk about is a pure measurement issue, and that has to do with uh, basically trends in uh, which men will be captured when we look at people who are employed and which men will be captured when we only survey the non-institutionalized and why we might be concerned about that when we're drawing inferences over time. So uh, the, the first topic I wanted to mention was um, just, just I just wanted to note that, that perhaps what was driving some of the improvements or many of the improvements that we saw at the bottom of the earnings distribution was the fact that the employment rates for women had increased quite a bit over the time period that, that uh, Becky studied. And I think it's the case, and, and actually, if there's anybody in the room that could tell me decisively whether that's the case, it's Becky, because she's written so much on this. But I think it is the case that a lot of that increase, uh, or a good chunk of it, can be explained by um, increases in labor force participation among single mothers surrounding welfare reform and the expansion of the earned income tax credit. So in the packet, I, I, I pulled a, a table from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities that just shows how uh, employment rates jumped for single mothers and never married mothers between 95 and 2000. And there really was a very discrete change associated with uh, those two large institutional reforms, the EIT expansion and the uh, welfare reform during the Clinton administration. Now, and then if, if you just look at figure two, the other interesting thing that we see is that among women who are eligible for TANF or AFDC, their participation rates have declined drastically. And of course, for many, that also means that uh, probably their coverage under the Medicaid program has declined unless states have, have made provisions to not uh, push them off Medicaid. And for many, it also corresponded to a decline in food stamp uh, uh, receipt. So there, there's this question that, yes, we've seen a large increase in labor supply. And the, the, apparently, the large increase in labor supply was large enough that um, we actually sort of undid the decrease in wages in terms of the ultimate impact on income. But we also have you know, a fairly large reduction in the amount of time that uh, many uh, women have to devote to household production and to non-market uses, and perhaps uh, declines in sort of um, things that are difficult to price, like health insurance and perhaps food stamp benefits, which maybe are, are easier to price. And so it just leaves me asking the question of at, at the bottom of the income distribution, despite the fact that, that there was some growth, really are they any better off given the institutional changes uh, that, that we've experienced? And I, I guess I'm, I'm agnostic with regards to the answer. It could be yes, they are better off, right? So I, I can see, you know, working at a job and, and uh, having that example for your children and possibly progressing through the income distribution is perhaps a, a much uh, uh, um, preferred life course than spending lots of, of time receiving public assistance and not progressing. 
Or it could be the case that, that you know, we can look at that as the glass being half empty, that working at a menial job and never progressing, uh, not having any time and not being able to watch her kids could be uh, much worse. But it, I think it would be helpful to maybe think along those lines or, or to put it differently, uh, you know, we have this, these changes in equality in terms of income and I'd like to sort of try to think about what does that mean for utility or what does that mean for welfare because income and welfare, uh, you know, income is one component into, into well-being but there are other things that matter as well. Um, the, the second topic that I wanted to talk about was with regards to uh, what's, what's happening in housing markets. So, so we, we saw in uh, the tables and the figures that um, uh, Becky presented yesterday that there was uh, clear evidence of, of rising incomes among the poorest of the poor. Over the same period of time, at least among poor renters, uh, there's also um, increases in the proportion of uh, income that they're devoting to covering their housing expenses. So there, there's a table in here from a, a paper that John Quigley and I wrote where we looked at uh, the fraction of income that people are devoting to rents for uh, renters by uh, quintile of the income distribution, as well as the proportion of people devoting more than 30% of their income to rent. And what you see over this time period is a pretty uh, large increase in, in all of these measures of rent burdens, right? So just the, the median income devoted to rent goes up among first uh, quintile households or, or, the, the, or poor households, the proportion devoted to rent is going from 44% in 1960 to 64% in 2000. And it, it just seems that, uh, that housing has become, is sort of commanding more of, of the share of the household budget uh, at the same time that, that rents are growing. And th there's another table uh, on the next uh, uh, page, which was an attempt I made recently to just look at, at the housing that people in the bottom quintile and the top quintile and all the quintiles in the middle are consuming, sort of taking both renter-occupied and owner-occupied housing and, and trying to convert it to a price and looking at, at annual nominal price appreciation, annual real price appreciation. And it, it seems to suggest that, that price appreciation is greatest at, at the bottom of the income distribution. Now, what could be happening here is that uh, the poor with incomes rising as they've been rising are just demanding more housing, right? So if housing is normal good and income rises, they're going to demand more. But you can work through sort of a simple back of the envelope calculation that suggests that perhaps something else is going on. And this again is from this paper that John and I wrote. So for example, between 60 and 2000, the real median income among bottom quintile renters increases by 38%. And at the same time, their real rents increase by 50%. So if you just sort of work through what the income elasticity of demand would be for housing, you get a value of 1.3, which is much in excess of uh, sort of scientific estimates of the income elasticity of demand for housing, suggesting that something else is going on. And so one hypothesis that, that has been advanced at least once before by Robert Frank and, and others is that as the, the country becomes wealthier, as the median household becomes wealthier, that might actually have impacts on people at the bottom of the housing, or not of the housing distribution, but, but people uh, at the bottom of the income distribution via a variety of, of mechanisms. So say, for example, that as you know, the median voter becomes wealthier, the median voter might impose through uh, local housing regulatory apparatus a higher minimum standard of housing that they believe to be what everybody should consume. Right? So we no longer allow people to live in SROs. We demand that everybody have a private entrance. We demand that everybody have a kitchen and an indoor bathroom. And these are good things. I love my indoor bathroom. Okay? <laughs> but that, that being said, right, if, if incomes don't rise to support uh, the, the um, increase in the housing prices to support those amenities, it could be the case that the amount of housing that is being forced to consume uh, for, for the lowest income might fall short of their income growth, and that actually might negatively increase their utility, right? Given the income, if they were unconstrained, they might have chosen a different level of housing consumption. And so th there are ways to think, you know, if you have growth in income, both at the bottom and the top, it still, be, it still could be the case that there are perhaps some consumption externalities that might be adversely impacting the poor. And I'm, you know, that's sort of hand waving a little bit, but I think that there are stories like that you can tell that are interesting, and they at least I think appeal to me in terms of uh, potentially being 
realistic considerations. Okay, so the final point I'm going to make is just, um, uh, now this is just a purely measurement issue, and that's with regards to uh, what happens when we try to infer things about distributions when we're, uh, number one, only looking at people who are employed, and then number two, surveying uh, people who are, who are non-institutionalized. So with regards to the, to the first point, we know that among uh, relatively low-skilled men, the employment or the proportion employed on any given day has declined considerably over the time period that Becky is studying. And essentially, if we're going to be looking at wages or annual income, uh, that, that means that we're, we're sort of focusing on a different portion of the population in 2007 than we are in 1979. Now, looking at annual income, that's not as much of a problem because most people work a little bit during the year. So if you're working one week, then you're going to be picked up. But nonetheless, there's a labor supply uh, issue. I think what might be more uh, of an issue uh, is the increasing proportion of men that on any given day are, are not going to be surveyed because they're either in jail or prison. So I have uh, two um, sort of sets of statistics here. One is simply uh, the number of jail or prison inmates per 100,000. It's a time series from 1980 to 2007. And you can see that that's going from a little over 200 in 1980 to a rate that is in excess of 700 in 2007, right? And this is following a period where, where we had a roughly stable incarceration rate. And essentially what that means is there will be a number of men who won't be in the CPS because the CPS only samples the non-institutionalized. And then the, the second figure is, is trying to put that into perspective with regards to um, uh, who you're not going to be sampling. And so these are, these are tabulations from the 1980 and the 2000 census, and it's the proportion of men by race, age, uh, and educational attainment that are uh, institutionalized on the day of the census, because the census actually will uh, uh, find people in jail and prison and, and enumerate them just as they enumerate anybody else. And you know the, the, the increases for most groups aren't that great, right? So for white men, it's, it's under a percent in 80, and then it goes to 1.3% in 2000. But for black men, it's pretty large, right? So you're going from you know 3.3% in 1980 to 8.4% in 2000 that are not going to be uh, in the census. Or if you look at um, you know high school dropouts or high school grads, the numbers are particularly big. Now, why is this important? Well, essentially, one would expect that the people who are not in a housing unit on the day that the CPS numerator knocks on the door uh, are probably being drawn disproportionately from the bottom of the income distribution. And to the extent that we're selecting people out of the income distribution in the later year that were there in the earlier year, it might actually make things look better than, than they are. And there's some very nice work by Bruce Western and Becky Pettit that has sort of shown that when you add these people back into the, the denominator for, say, employment to population ratio, trends look a lot different. Uh, but that's a you know, minor issue. Other than that, I, I really enjoyed the paper, and I, uh, I learned quite a bit. And, and actually, I learned something new, and that's always good. I'm done. Thank you, Steve. Right. Um, and our next discussion is Bob Reich. Bob, it's your turn. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, Becky, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, Mike, thank you for joining us this morning as well. Uh, I also learned a lot from the paper, and I uh, and my learning was very much along the lines of Steve's. That is, uh, once you look at the different units, whether it's a family unit or a household, uh, you do get some very interesting differences. And I too uh, often succumb to looking at wages uh, and forget. Uh, but not only do you forget that how is it that the household and the family units come up uh, with uh, sort of different patterns. But you also forget that there are all sorts of cause and effects going in every direction with regard to what happens to households and what happens to families. Uh, as women go into the paid workforce in greater numbers and also as they do better uh, in the paid workforce, uh, not only do they tend to form their own households, uh, it's easier for them, uh, but it's not as necessary for them to marry. Uh, in fact, they, uh, and this is a point that Sandy Jenks has made several times, uh, you know, it's a better deal for them to, uh, to basically uh, find the best deal they can get in terms of a man. Uh, and uh, uh, if the man doesn't work out, find another man. Uh, and the marriage contract is pretty inefficient 
with regard to continuing to find uh, the best partner you can. Uh, I wanted to go back to something that Mike was talking about because I think that that <coughs> helps explain a great mystery, uh, and that is what happened beginning in the 1970s. Because if you look at widening inequality, you see uh, that the launching pad really is the 1970s, and it's not only in the United States. Uh, you look at international data on widening inequality among advanced nations, and you find uh, that uh, inequality, uh, whether you're looking at wages, uh, particularly wages, but also in many respects, household uh, and also <coughs> family inequality, uh, begins to widen in the 1970s. It can't all be explained by differences in family structure. It can't all be explained by differences in household structure. And certainly it's not, uh, a lot of it is wages, but, but the question is, why? Um, I think uh, Mike and uh, Larry Katz and Claudia Golden give us some interesting, very useful data on the supply of educated people. And there's no question that demand is shifting in favor of skilled people. Uh, why is demand shifting so rapidly in favor of skilled people? And why does it start shifting so rapidly in the 1970s? That is sort of an interesting question. Mike, you began getting at it. Uh, I don't feel like I have the full answer, but it may have something to do uh, with uh, the increasing portion of this economy and other economies subjected, uh, not uh, subjected to international trade or affected by international trade. Uh, and affected by the technological changes that are inextricably bound up with international trade, cargo ships, container ships, satellite communication technologies, all of which come on stream beginning in the 1970s and to an even greater effect in the 1980s. Um, I would love, Becky, you to kind of respond to that because, again, it's beyond the United States. It's sort of all over the place. And uh, those who have more education uh, are doing better and better. Uh, perhaps because, given globalization and technological change, uh, uh, there is more uh, demand for skilled workers who can innovate. Uh, the entry barrier to a lot of businesses moves from scale uh, to innovation. And if it's innovation, then uh, there's a high demand for people who can innovate and less and less demand for people who are in commodity-like jobs. Uh, they get stuck in the local personal service sector of the economy. Get, they get thrown out of uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing shrinks. Uh, manufacturing, manufacturing shrinkage also obviously uh, makes upward mobility more difficult uh, for those who have uh, fewer skills because suddenly all those middle rungs on the uh, job ladder are, have disappeared. Uh, the other thing I would like your response to is the effects of uh, macroeconomic policy on inequality. Uh, having struggled in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, uh, with uh, uh, coming up with job training programs and uh, income supplements and putting into, into place uh, the beginnings of the earned income tax, the expansion of the earned income tax credit that Steve referred to, uh, I was struck in the 1990s that uh, none of this really tended to have a, much of an impact. And it wasn't until uh, the economy started really moving uh, quite rapidly. Alan Greenspan uh, allowed uh, uh, basically a, a monetary policy to accommodate uh, a much lower rate of unemployment uh, that uh, you started seeing uh, substantial increases uh, in incomes among uh, the poor. Uh, because uh, employers needed them. I mean, they were, you know, in fact, uh, we, we were, we, I, I had been visiting a lot of poor neighborhoods with high, not only high unemployment, uh, but uh, basically people who never showed up. They were too discouraged to look for work. They never worked for work, looked for work. Uh, they were um, in and out of prison, or, and they were in a, the, the kind, of, uh, a, a kind of black market economy to, the, to some extent. But uh, in 1997, 1998, I toured a lot of these communities, and I was amazed to see vans coming in uh, from uh, employers in the suburbs uh, looking for workers, uh, and actually, in some cases, offering to train people. Uh, and uh, that went on for a couple of years. And as a result, 
You know, we saw some real uh, substantial changes, I would say, in, uh, in the poverty uh, population. Uh, we tend not to spend, in my view, enough time thinking about the Fed uh, and macroeconomic policy generally uh, and its effect on, uh, on poverty. Uh, so, again, I, I offer that and uh, also would be very interested in your responses. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, at this point, um, I think I'd like to exercise the Chair's prerogative to make one comment myself, a kind of an extended comment, and then, then let Becky, Becky respond. Uh, <coughs> my comment is also uh, intended to perhaps invite later discussion from all of you. Um, I thought that, um, I thought Becky's paper is terrific, really very interesting. I found it fascinating to understand the, um, the how, how changes in what women were doing and what was being done to women in terms of perhaps government policies and things like that, to how, that, how that's affected inequality, and I hadn't really seen that. Uh, anywhere before as strongly as Becky made it. I think that's a very important contribution. I was really pleased to see it. Um, but what I didn't see uh, or didn't hear too much about until we got to the question period last night, what, uh, and my, really my central question, the central point I'm trying to ask is, should there be more of a public policy component to the analysis that Becky does? Um, particularly because she will be, be extending and polishing the work that she's already presented into a, into a short book for our series. And so there was no explicit public policy focus to any of the things that were presented last night. Um, and the question is, should there be? Should there be part of this? Now, I have, and I have a few examples that I'll mention of things possibly that could be done, although Becky has much better knowledge than I do about what what might be possible, if anything. Um, so one of my things is exactly the same point that Steve made, but I'll, I'll, say it, I'll, I'll say it again because, because we did not conspire. I didn't know he was going to make it. But, but if welfare reforms were very important to understanding some of the changes at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the income distribution, well, it's pretty hard to see that from two data points, one in 1979 and the other in 2007. And I said it would be much more persuasive to me to, to focus on, on that as, a, as an explanation if I could see more data points in between and really know that post-1996 is when a lot of these changes happened. Uh, so that would be one way of trying to focus more specifically, is it really a public policy that's having this effect? That would be one, one kind of public policy focus. Um, in, in response to questions last night, uh, Becky mentioned uh, quickly, I think, that she would favor a further expansion of the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a great idea, uh, but in some sense, in the context of this paper, it's kind of like wishful thinking. I mean, I could say that, you could say that, we could talk about the progressiveness of the tax system, which I'll mention in a minute, but actually what effect would that have? What are we talking about? What kind of expansion? And would it be sensible to have, have a, a, an additional simulation in, in, on your data of what the effect of an expanded EITC would be? I recognize you can't do a full paper on that kind of thing, but, but it could, could there be more, more, uh, more analysis that sort of t tries to make it be more serious about what this would, what, what kind of expansion. Um, and the last thing I'll mention in terms of possible policy focuses is, is it has to do with the progressiveness, huge changes in the progressiveness of the federal tax system over the period of time that Becky was analyzing. And it's somewhat unusual. Becky made a calculation that's somewhat unusual when she looked at pre-tax income of families and then added in government income and other income, but did not subtract government tax payments. Whereas, you know, what the argument might be that most people would care about what's your disposable income, not your pre-tax income. 
and especially with all the changes in the progressiveness of the tax system over this period, that might make the results be more dramatic than even the ones that, that, you, that, that you found. Uh, and so uh, you also mentioned in response to questions that you would favor, you would favor a, you know, a, a slight return, a modest return to a more progressive system, not going all the way back to the, to the high marginal rates of the of 1960s, but, um, but moving somewhat in that direction. And again, the question would be, well, what effect would that have on your data? How much change would that cause? How much of a reduction in inequality would that cause? So those are just different ideas about a possible policy focus. Uh, and there may be other things. There's macroeconomic policy, like Bob mentioned, and, and other things. But I, I sort of think it would be nice if there were, were a little bit more of a policy focus somewhere. It, it, to, to add to a work that's already a great, very interesting piece of work. Good. Thank you. Um, so let me start by being, by being a little controversial here, okay? Because I have the impression there's two big issues in this paper, and none of the discussants really talked about them, and it's probably my fault for not bringing them out far enough in the paper. But um, I really am interested in those big issues, and I hope that <coughs> after this we can actually have a little conversation about them. So. The first part of the paper, which is the quantitative exploration, is really a claim that, yes, there's widening inequality, and you've got to understand it in a much more nuanced way if you're looking beyond wages, and I think that's just right. And a lot of it relates to um, um, uh, you know, sort of changes in labor market behavior as well as changes in wages. But the widening inequality goes along with very substantial increases in median incomes and sort of average well-being where this distribution sits. And so, one interpretation of what I'm finding, and I will say this in a controversial way in an audience where there are a lot of people who spend a lot of their life talking about the problems of inequality. Um, maybe the problems of inequality aren't as bad as we've been talking about. Maybe, you know, as I think I say at several points, um, if you look at people at equivalent points in the income distribution, almost all of them are better off in 2007 and then 1979. And so if you're comparing absolute well-being, um, actually those upward shifts in medians are very strong much stronger than I expected. I think the biggest surprise of the paper for me is how much the medians of those distributions have shifted up. Um, but, you know, relative, particularly if you're sitting in the bottom half of the distribution, relative to the top, you're worse off because you're further away from the top. So this question of are you judging absolute well-being, are you judging relative well-being, and how does that influence how you view the inequality trends the left use becomes very, very crucial once you see how big these median increases are. And I would love to come back to a discussion of that issue because I think that's the, the issue that more than anything else that first part of the paper raises um, and which I think has been much under discussed in the literature where we focus just on the most rapidly widening component which is wages and, and, the, and particularly for men where there has been very little median shift. Right, so we've looked at this one very particular piece of total income where we really had widening inequality with half the group getting worse, half the group getting better. And you know, we can talk about that, but I, you know, I, I think the bigger picture really is different and raises some different questions. And, and I think potentially gives us a reason as to why you know, the folks here who tried to argue that inequality is a major social issue haven't gotten the traction they wanted. Well, you know, if everyone really is making $7,000 more on average, which is sort of the total income upward shift in, in, in the median of the distribution. Um, that explains why people may be a little less worried about inequality um, than some of the analysis. So I say that in, I, you know, I put that in sort of the most controversial way because I want to come back to a discussion of that. I, I'd really love to hear what people think. The second part of the paper, and no one here mentions the second part, and maybe that says they don't like it very much. I, I wrote the second part first, which is sort of the, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, partly because I didn't have my quantitative work done and found doing it very interesting. I think it needs a little more formalization than it has right now. But the main comment in the second part of the paper, which is the, the qualitative, the, the, the sort of the, the review of the literature on what changes trends in inequality and how do major social and economic events affect inequality trends, is really the endogeneity of inequality. The fact that you know, there's nothing that inherently in a developed country leads to increasing or decreasing inequality. And even when you think about such major events as wars or deep recessions, are huge technological changes, how those things carry themselves out in the real economy depends very, very much on the political economy in which they sit. And developed countries can shape the ways in which those sorts of things affect or don't affect the income distribution. And um, 
you know, that, uh, that that's sort of the main point of that second part. And um, again, I've, if any people have comments on that, I would I, I would love to re to receive them. And you know, you know, how much how is that clear? Or that? So, having said that, um, let me come back and talk about the. Um, um, this is some of the comments here, and I won't talk about all of them, but let me just hit a few. Um, so there's a discussion here. So this is all increase. You know, one of the main points here is that there's been big increases in the median in earnings, and a lot of this is increased work, and a lot of this is increased work by women. Okay, for single mothers, welfare reform in the late '80s was important, but it is not the major thing driving increases in work among all women between 1979 and 2007. And in fact, when I talk about married couples, virtually none of whom were affected by welfare reform, one of the more striking graphs I think in the paper is the graph that shows how much work and earnings have increased among the wives of high, earning, uh, high earnings men. Um, you know, and you know, that huge increase has nothing to do with welfare reform whatsoever. It actually precedes the late 1990s. It's happening throughout the 80s and early 90s, and it, it slows down by the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, so that if you're looking just at the single moms, you've really got to talk about welfare reform because their labor supply is flat until the mid-90s, and then it, it, it goes up quite rapidly. Um, but if you're talking about all women, um, the single moms are, you know, are, are a piece of this, but they're only one piece. And the overall increases in labor supply among all women and among married women, um, and it's not just increase going into the labor market, but in but those who work increases in the number of you know the, the amount that they work over the year. Um, both of those things are happening, and um, they're just fewer and fewer women out of the labor market. There are fewer women working sort of very low hours, uh, very low annual hours, and very few weeks of work. And um, that that's. Uh, I don't want to say welfare reform is irrelevant. It's quite important to one subpopulation. But um, we shouldn't think about this as a welfare reform story primarily. Welfare reform is one piece of a number of different pieces. And the whole question of why did female labor supply increase, I think for many, you know, the higher educated women actually show bigger increases in propensity to work and the amount that they work over this whole time period than less educated women. And my own sense, and, and, and you know, this is a hard one to come up with the data, and, and, and there's been some effect, effects, efforts of this, is you know, this is an opening up of a set of labor market opportunities for those women. You know, who's the most constrained in a world where women actually face serious discrimination and barriers in the workforce? It's the most educated, and therefore who gain the most um, when those barriers fall. Um, and, and I think that's just what you're seeing of sort of these wives of these more educated men in, in part. So I, I, do, I don't want to not talk about welfare reform, but I don't want to make welfare reform the center of um, everything that's going on here with the female labor supply. All right, that's comment number one. Um, comment number two, um, this whole college education, sort of the skill bias technological change issue. So what's very clear is that the demand for more skilled workers went up very rapidly, starting about the mid-1970s. And I think Bob's question is absolutely right. Why did that happen? Um, and then the second question is, why didn't supply go up just as rapidly? Okay, and you've got to ask both of those questions. Um, you know, because the demand going up is very important, but particularly in the US, <laughs> in fact, supply doesn't keep pace with it, is, is equally interesting. Um, so let me sort of take both of those questions and talk about them a little. I don't think we, you know, and no one fully understands what happens in, the, in that late 70s that is actually the beginning of this trend towards widening inequality. And, um, you know, I can repeat all the standard lines that people use. I mean, you did have, um, about that time, a complete shakeout in, in, in manufacturing, particularly in the U.S., which translates into some other parts of the world as well, and much greater competition in manufacturing with, together with an adoption of a series of techniques that mean throughout the developed world, you're shedding labor and manufacturing. And you know, you know, you, you know, this is largely sort of smarter technologies with the requirement that you need fewer people with strong backs and more people who could handle the machinery. Um, but, um, but it's clearly very quickly <coughs> spreads out of manufacturing into the service sector. And you know, there's a bunch of books written in the mid-1980s saying this is all you know, a blue-collar story and it's a decline in manufacturing. And it's very clear even by the mid-'80s this is not just about manufacturing, that it's happening in the service sector as well. And you know, what is it that, you know, what, what's the symbol of the change of the service sector is the Walmarts of the world who start running these just-in-time inventory <laughs> systems, again, with a series of very smart machines um, that allow them to simply completely restructure big box retail. Um, and then you add on to that it, all sorts of service sectors where, uh, again, you're replacing certain types of workers with machines. So, you know, none of us pump, our, uh, none of us use service station attendants anymore. We all pump our own gas and use those, those machines. None of us use bank tellers anymore. Except we all go to ATMs. Pardon? Except, Except in New, New Jersey, Jersey where, where, you know, <laughs> public policy, as I say, is in Dodge. There's some governor who clearly had a brother-in-law who owned a lot of gas stations. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I could figure. Um, 
So, uh, you know, and, and, and then those changes occur at the same time you see a set of institutional changes, and it's not quite clear where the chickens and eggs are and who's, what's coming first here, but you start seeing a very rapid rise in merit pay. And it's clear that merit pay widens inequality. And again, you see this in all sorts of different sections. It's not just in manufacturing where you start doing, you know, various service quality circles and, you know, whatever all the, you know, that, but, but, but you, you, know, you see it you know, throughout um, a restructuring of sort of corporate America as how they evaluate and pay people. Um, you know, and that in turn goes along with a series of other changes. What's very important here, uh, probably most important in the um, 80s and 90s is declining unionization which really leads to widening inequality at the bottom among men um, because so many more men are unionized and in some of these jobs. And about 20% um, of the wage loss here is pure uh, deunionization over that period. And, and you know, so you've got this whole set of things that are happening at about the same time. You know, it, it's very, very hard to separate uh, first movers between the institutional changes, the technology changes, and then overlapping this, the global competitive changes when you're trying to tell the story across countries. Um, and it's clear the global competitive forces are an important piece of this, but it is really hard in the data to separate that out. And economists have just not been able to do it effectively. And we just don't have the data that you want is part of the answer. So you know that, that's a very unsatisfying answer to your question, Bob. But um, you know, <laughs> I wish I could give you a better one. I was hoping you knew the answer. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to use that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, the question is, so, so why didn't supply change along with this? And I very much agree with Mike that at least part of the story is institutional changes in education in the United States. Now, I don't entirely buy in. Here's the questions that I don't understand about this story, Mike. Um, there's many things I don't understand about the, what's happening with colleges. But, um, you know, so one of the things that the U.S. pioneers in the 60s and 70s are community colleges. And yes, indeed, there are some supply constraints in the four-year colleges, but there aren't supply constraints in the community colleges. They're growing enormous. It's the community colleges that are opening up in the 80s and 90s. And indeed, the whole hope was, and if you'd asked me in the mid-70s, I would have said, of course this is going to happen, is the community college system was going to take the group of people who maybe weren't ready to go straight into four-year colleges. It was going to move a whole group of new people into post-college education, and then a whole bunch of those people would go on and fo get four-year degrees who didn't. So I think part of the question here is not just what happened to four-year colleges, but what did or didn't happen with the community colleges that they didn't fill the bill that they should have filled. And, you know, and maybe the story goes back, in fact, I know part of the story goes back to what happens in particularly urban school districts, that you know, some of which is due to schools, some of which is due to other socioeconomic and demographic changes and shifts, um, and, um, and you know, racial shifts and all sorts of things that make fewer and fewer people ready. Um, to move into that system effectively, and therefore they don't get the benefits of the system. So you know you keep pushing it back further. Um, but you know the college question is really interesting. I will put one additional piece on top of this without just blaming the universities, and and uh, certainly I think the access and the cost issues are highly important here. But there is a very interesting paper, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend it. Of course, I'm blanking entirely on the name of the person who wrote it. She's an economist out at UC, um, UC Riverside, a junior economist, who, and it's, it's, it's a really interesting paper where she goes into the time use data. And her claim is that college students who, in the early 1960s, and all of the time use data we have available then, all reported themselves as putting 40 to 45 hours a week into their studies and their academic work. Um, over time, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way through, and we've got a whole bunch of time use surveys over this time period, and she does a quite convincing job, I think, of telling you this isn't just data problems. Um, you see a very steady decline in the number of hours that college students put into work, so that um, you have 20 hours a week on average being put into college work among students at the, um, no, I mean, I, and, I, mean I, I was really struck by this. I mean, it made me say, if I was still teaching classes, boy, I'd go back to requiring more work. Um, you know, but it, it, it's, it's a widespread decline. She shows it's happening in higher end and lower. I mean, she just shows it happening throughout the higher education system. And of course, it's behind, in part, why people are taking five or six years to graduate, but you know, they're working more when they're in college in some cases. You know, but it's a very puzzling, you know, so I'm not clear it's not entirely not the kids. I mean, you know, and, you know, sort of, so what's happening there? How does that interact with what's happening with access and cost? And you know, I, it's a really puzzling set of issues that it's amazing those who actually live in this world have a clue um, to understand quite exactly what's going on. And I, 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 I just want so I, 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 it's an important and interesting set of questions. All right. Steve raises the question of, well, so even if incomes are going up, maybe prices are shifting in such a way that it doesn't make you better off, okay? And, and again, very important issue. So one question is, how do you view a CPI adjustment, okay? That, you know, we are doing everything with um, um, adjustments for, you know, cost of living and cost of living embed in them changes in prices, right? And changes in relative prices. So if you think the CPI adjustment 
gets the relative price changes right, um, then you've taken account of it. Now, I can make you all sorts of arguments as to why it might not, but I can tell you none of those arguments would begin to get you to it's so wrong that actually that $7,000 in shifts in median income just isn't real at all. Um, but it is a valid question to ask how are people spending their money now versus in the past and does that affect their well-being. There is no question that the relative price of, um, of um, housing has gone up and that's the thing that's increased the most. You know, utility prices have gone up and down. If you looked at utility prices four years ago, you know, they were at, you know, they were back at the same levels of the 1970s. Um, you know, if you look at them a year ago, they're, they're much higher. Um, clothing and um, uh, food prices have unambiguously declined um, over time. And, 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 and so some of the increase in the share of income going to housing is other things that become cheaper. Some of it is that housing quality by every measure that we have, even among low-income families, has gone up. And there are a variety of quality, you know, are there holes in your wall? You know, do you actually have a working toilet? Do you, you know, this, this whole, you know, do you have regular heat? A whole series of questions like that sort that we've asked over a long period of time. And, um, and both the amount of space that low-income families have and the quality of their housing appears to have risen. So that should drive a little bit higher increase in housing costs as a share of their income. But I think particularly over the last several years, over the 2000s, um, there's clearly been housing bubbles that have had some very negative effects on the incomes of low-income people. I don't know how that plays out over the 30-year period. It definitely plays out over the last six, though. We might have solved that problem um, real effectively in the last year. But um, I, you know, the larger question here is, how do you go from a measure of income to a measure of well-being? And Steve and I were chatting about this earlier. And, and I think one of the things the paper lacks right now and really needs is a discussion of how do you think about well-being and how much should you be swayed, persuaded by income numbers that they tell you something. And I, you know, I've written in a number of other places, particularly with the single moms, about these whole set of questions of, well, so they have more money, but you know, childcare costs are greater, transportation costs are greater, they have less time for parenting, which might be a real constraint if you're a single parent. Um, because they're spending more at work, um, more time at work, and and it's not you know it's not at all clear that some aggregate measure of well-being has gone up among that group, even though their cash income has gone up. I think it's much harder to argue that for these you know two income married couples who are both you know making a lot of money and working full time. I mean that's that's much more clearly a choice. You know then I'm having me economists for that group. You know that's a choice. You know <laughs> those those guys could could have chosen a little less income and a little less market work and been just fine. And the fact they didn't tells you they like the choice they made. You know, or you know, for up to, up to a point. So I, but um, uh, um, I, the the well-being discussion I think does need to be fleshed out a little more um, in terms of what can you and can't you interpret from this, and what doesn't income tell you about um, macro policy. Let me end with that. Um, so one of the most important things, and I, I ought to say, I, I try to say it in so many other things that I've written, and it's not in this paper yet, but uh, right now is. Um, the most important thing we can do for low-income families is to make sure we have very low unemployment, period, full stop. You know, let's not talk about taxes. Let's not talk about redistribution and, and welfare programs and food stamps and the ITC. You know, forget all that stuff. The most important thing is a high employment economy with low, low unemployment rates because the vast majority of income for everybody, no matter where you are, comes through earnings in the labor market. And if you don't have a job, you're, you know, there's nothing else that's going to make up for that. I, pro I promise you the amount of money that we put into any form of redistributional program is peanuts compared to what people will get out of earning. And we're just not that generous as a society. Um, so um, you know, at, at base, the macroeconomy is, um, you know, is the first anti-poverty policy that you got to worry about. And of course, we're in a world right now where everything is going the wrong direction on that. And um, you know, as, as I mentioned last night, I, I worry a lot, particularly for these single moms who you know, did everything we asked of them. They went out, they went to work, they increased their earnings, they went off welfare. Um, we've now pulled the rug out from under them. And um, I, I worry a lot about what's going to happen to them and whether they're going to be able to, at least in the short run before jobs come back, be able to reaccess welfare. And I think it's a very, very big social question. Um, and the well-being of those kids is something we should all think about. Um, so the macro policy here, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, probably, you know, uh, educate long, you know, long. If you can talk about long-run issues, the education issues. I think dominate that at any point in time, if you want to ask about who's poor and who's not poor and what can we do um, to reduce poverty, the first thing you have to talk about is what does the labor market look like. And um, you know, there are a variety of things in terms of job training and creation programs and wage subsidies and all sorts of stuff that we can do, but those are all peanuts relative to what the Federal Reserve does. 
um, in, 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 in terms of manipulating money supplies. So that it, now, actually, right now, the Federal Reserve can't do very much with manipulating money supplies, so they're off the hook. But Congress, you know, obviously is doing something with fiscal stimulus, and it's going to be very interesting to see how much kick we get off this fiscal stimulus with regard to jobs. The CBO estimates is that, you know, we're going to reduce unemployment by between a half a point to one and a half points um, over this next year as a result of the fiscal stimulus package. And, you know, that, that would be very good if indeed we accomplish that, because in the absence of that, I think unemployment is going up to 10 percent, and uh, that's, that's not a good number. Um, finally, let me end with Lee's question of should there be more of a discussion of public policy. So in the second part of the paper, I do try to talk about public policy, that I don't make a lot of recommendations. Um, in a sense, the whole discussion of inequality is, you know, I, I didn't feel like it led naturally into a conversation about what should we do next. I, I think the discussion of the policy, the extent there's a discussion of policy, actually ought to come in that second section, or it's actually the third section of the papers it's now written, when I say what would increase or what would change the trend in inequality. And I sort of lay out a variety of things, and I think I could in that section say, so what are the things that we could do in terms of policy that would, you know, that list of here's the four things that would actually turn around this trend toward inequality, which are stated in terms of what if people accepted higher taxes, what if they, um, you know, the current recession led people to be more accepting of redistributional, pro of a broader set of redistributional programs, what are some of the things that we could explicitly do that would underscore that, that could turn around this 30-year trend? I, I think that's a, that, that potentially would add some specifics to that last section, um, which, which could be quite useful. And I, you know, I appreciate that comment. So, um, you know, I'll go wherever you guys want to go in terms of comments, but I, I really would love some discussion on sort of this, um, this issue of, well, maybe inequality isn't as bad a problem as we, as we thought it was. I mean, I, I really posed the question that way because I was quite struck with how big these income gains were in the distributions when I looked at total income and, and all that. I'm pretty sure this is not the way I did the data. I mean, I've actually pushed the, partly because I was surprised, I pushed the data pretty hard to make sure that this really is there. Um, and um, that, that to me was the most surprising result from the paper. And uh, uh, I, it, partly this conversation tells me I need to write that up more strongly. But, yeah. uh, we've all had our go. Mm -hmm. So I will defer to everybody else. But I would like to get back to this question of absolute mm -hmm. versus relative. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. John? Well, yeah. Yeah, uh, before you get to this normative question, I, I guess I'm struck in the discussion last night and in the paper um, in the inexorability of the increased inequality. Mm -hmm. um, we have this important change in skill-based technical change and the compensation associated with it. That's not going away. If anything, it's gotten stronger over time. Mm -hmm. We have a fundamental change in labor markets where um, skill-based change, compensation for skill um, among females all of a sudden changes from nothing to, to, to everything. Uh, associated with that, you have this uh, sort of mating system in the scheme and the golden household. Um, and um, what do you have on the other side that would compensate for that, that would affect it? Well, you can muck around with marginal tax rates, 39% or 36%. That's the big fight in Washington. It's irrelevant. Um, you could increase the EITC um, and, and take single people, mm -hmm. that's, that, that would matter. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing you could do is, is really invest in, in skills and education, and that's very, very hard. And it's not clear we can do that. We, we've, so, we, so it would be a real yeah. commitment to do yeah. it, yeah. and it, it's hard to see how we would have it. So let me give you a slightly different answer to that. Because you could do all of those things and say, assuming this trend is going to continue, how do you offset? You know, there is a techno-optimistic answer, all right? And neither you nor I know whether this will occur, but there is a small group out there that argues skill bias technological change is not inevitable forever. And indeed, if you think what these technologies do is create smart machines, at some point, the machines become smart enough. Our ability to use this technology becomes good enough that actually we become um, low-skilled <coughs> enhancing with the machines as opposed to low-skilled displacing. And you know, and, and you know, th th that argument has been made. It's made rather cogently. You know, there's, there's these um, these articles in economics that look at the electricity revolution, right? Uh, and and they're claiming this it took 30 to 40 years before we figured out how to use electricity in the way that it actually brought broad-based and redistributional um, changes to the workplace and to the American consumer. And you know, we're only 20 years into this computer stuff. 
And, you know, maybe it's going to be another 10 years. Now, I, I find that a very techno-optimistic argument. It's sort of like the people who think we're going to solve global warming if we just sit back and let the, the scientists experiment. You know, we really don't have to worry about this as a policy because technology will save us. But, you know, it's not impossible that at least in some areas, as we get better at some of this technology, as the chips get smaller and faster and all the other things that they're doing, that there are a number of ways in which these technologies stop being so skilled biased and start actually helping lower skilled workers um, hold better jobs than they're holding right now. So I, I, I put that on the offset side as well. Henry. Yeah, uh, this absolute versus relative deprivation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, normatively, there's a question about what mm -hmm. we should be concerned about, and that's a tough argument. And mm -hmm. Obviously, maybe lifting some people out of real deprivation is a good thing, so absolute seems to matter. But, but the relative, empirically, it seems to me, one of the lessons of a lot of political science and modern behavioral economics is that reference points matter a lot and that people care about relative deprivation maybe more than absolute, so that there's that whole body of literature. At the same time, there's a whole body of political science literature which shows that most people, for example, think that uh, they should be opposed to the death tax, the estate tax, because someday they may have an estate that large and so forth. So even though, objectively, there's no chance they're ever going to have to pay the death tax. They nevertheless are opposed to it. And the Republicans have been very successful in using that as the basis for being um, opposed to the, the estate tax. So that leads us sort of in two directions. But it seems to me there is a chance for a political movement that might appeal to the concerns people have for relative deprivation. And I think Bernie Madoff and the financiers in Wall Street and all these kinds of things uh, make people matter and matter at rich elites that could lead to a social movement that would be based upon that. So politically, it's possible, it seems to me, that this country could be concerned more and more about the relative deprivation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that, cry, and I can imagine people saying, well, absolutely, we're better off, but I'm not sure it's going to get very far. But, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So um, I guess I think, you know, as in some way in terms of economists analyzing the issue, I actually think the absolute changes are quite important, and they, you know, and they, you know, they're consistent with the fact, you know, housing size has gone up, and you know, all sorts of things. If you, if you look at the consumption type data, um, you know, Americans look a lot better off in that data than they do in certain income-based series. Um, and I'm sorry, we yeah. borrowed it. Well, it's, it's up to a point, but um, you know, I, you know, this. I, I do think that the absolute comparisons matter. If you say, you know, you know the median person has seven thousand more dollars, you know, that's that's a real improvement in income, and I wouldn't want to dismiss that and say, well, nobody really cares about. Well, that. I'm not. I'm but, saying but normally it may be, but yeah, I'm asking but, politically, right, ultimately, what right. do you think? But you know, really if you ask me, you know, realistically, what do people do? I mean, most people don't probably because they just you know couldn't if they wanted to have the ability to say, well, what would a person just like me be like in 1979? Right. Oh, they would have seven thousand dollars less. I feel really good about my life. You know, that's not what people do, right? Um, you know, what people do is they look around and they say, you know, gosh, Henry, you've got so much more money than I have, and I sort of thought we started about the same place. You know, I must have been doing very well. Um, and, you know, so there's no question that the relative incomes matter. And I mean, I, I think there's a variety of reasons to be concerned about widening income inequality. I, it, uh, to me, it's less the relative comparisons, quite honestly, than it is the economic mobility questions. And to what extent you, you say you harden certain um, points in the distribution, make it very, very hard for people to you know, escape, particularly at the bottom end. Um, and, 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 you, and not just make it perhaps um, sort of institutionally difficult, but um, you create a set of expectations that says people just say, I can't possibly do that, even, even despite the way they're voting on debt taxes, right? Well, you see, I think that's, well, the, that's yeah. the key. Yeah. Uh, to Henry's question. Yeah. That is, you get a populist backlash when people yeah. feel as if the game is rigged yeah. and they can't get upwardly mobile. Yeah. That combined with economic yeah. insecurity, another variable that we really haven't talked about, mm -hmm. uh, generates, you know, the that's the soil from which demagogues, mm -hmm. in which demagogues thrive. I mean, political uh, scientists do worry about these things. Yeah. 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 I understand that, yeah. yeah. Jane, I think you were next, and Cheryl. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I wanted to comment first on your uh, claim of a sharp increase in uh, median incomes, because as I read it, it's mm -hmm. not that much, proportionately. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 25% over 28 years. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. less, that's quite a bit less on an annual basis than our productivity mm -hmm. gain. So then you can ask the question, well, mm -hmm. where does the rest of it go? And it goes to capital. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Is it top 1%? Yes, yes it, it goes to capital. Right. So people aren't wrong in mm -hmm. thinking that other people have mm -hmm. done better than them, and in fact, the, and saying that it goes to capital means that it goes, in fact, to the parts that you don't see as obviously, it's the mm -hmm. measures of wealth 
rather than the measures of income. And people know intuitively that other people who are richer than them mm -hmm. have more even mm -hmm. than you see. They've got the, the, the wealth, or at least they did until mm -hmm. you know six months ago. They're still doing okay. So that's one thing I would say. I would actually, I was rather shocked that we hadn't done better. I wasn't shocked. I was just like, okay, well, more of the same. This doesn't surprise me. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, even that level of median income gain is in part an artifact of women's labor force participation. And I think we need to push on this a little further. Because I totally agree with you that above, the, in the top one third, say, it's a, a it's unconstraining mm -hmm. women's choices. Mm -hmm. And those women are able to provide the household services that they wish to provide mm -hmm. and pay for good quality household services that they mm -hmm. don't wish to provide. And looking in the background of your whole talk at children, because you focused mm -hmm. on the group 18 to 64, who are, are or recently were parents. Um, and by focusing on them, we can, I think, should bring them a little further to the mm -hmm. foreground. I know it's not mm -hmm. your theme. But they, they, I, I don't mm -hmm. like to see them entirely mm -hmm. absent. Mm -hmm. And when you bring children into the mix, you can say children also are probably made better off if they're at the top end, in the top third, because again, their, parent, their mothers are happier, they see whatever, all the, yeah. all the feminist stories, yeah. all those stories. Yeah. But let's go down yeah. to the other bottom third, and what you've actually done is see a lot more women paying other women to provide mm -hmm. services. So you've got an, it's a pure artifact of adding to GDP, it's the stuff I learned when I was <laughs> the very first economics class, right? Um, and it, it, it by no means necessarily corresponds to a gain in well-being and indeed, mm -hmm. so then these questions about whether children are made better off by whether their mothers are working and the impact of welfare reform on, on, on children and so forth, and it's an ambiguous question. Which I, I, it certainly isn't a wealth yeah. or income yeah. gain. Yeah, and I, I have a discussion at some point, which, as I say, I think the well-being discussion needs to be expanded, where I so say, look, it's very ambiguous in terms of well-being for those in the bottom half of the distribution that these big increases in female labor force participation were in some aggregate sense welfare enhancing. You know, and they were much more forced because of declining male wages and declining marriage. Um, and you, know, you can say, yes, there's some choices involved with that, but choices involved within a very constrained economic environment. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 like I say, I think reading, you know, what we'd all love to have done was to have seen a, you know, an, in, an upward shift in the income distribution that was entirely driven by increases in wages, right, as opposed to increases in work effort. And, um, you know, we got this more out of work effort than out of wages, though for women there were wage increases too, you know, so, um, and, and that just makes it harder to interpret um, beyond the income level what really happened to overall well-being. Uh, because you've got to value something about labor force. And, you know, in welfare reform, I might note, we made a very clear policy choice in welfare reform, which is that there are no, ne you know, all of the effects of work are positive. You know, there's no, you know, there's, there's no question that that policy was unambiguous in terms of what it said and how it said. You know, economists say that there's, you know, a leisure labor trade-off. The policymakers said, no, there's not. Um, you know, that we're, you know, you are better off, you know, the more that you work, and we are going to enforce that. And, you know, if, if you believe that well, statement, you know, that, then, then you could evaluate like, this, right? We're, but, we're better off yeah. if you go to work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, it's yeah. devil's workshop. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering, yeah. I was yeah. wondering yeah. if you could comment on the possibility of finding some way in, in real life mm -hmm. data to look at the um, possibility that uh, the measure of income might not be, income comparison mm -hmm. to other people might not be the full story mm -hmm. about the reference point by which people are comparing their well-being to others. Because I see a lot of action going on psychologically around fear of losing a job. And you might be able to sustain mm -hmm. your income compared to your peers over time, but you're going to hustle a lot harder, you're going to switch jobs more, and you're going to worry about losing your job a lot more than peers, perhaps. And those things matter a lot to well-being, even though the income level mm -hmm. stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be one possible way to yeah. back up one level towards well-being. And I wanted to see if you thought there was a data strategy for looking at that. So there have been a group of people who've looked at variance in income trying to get at exactly that issue. Has income yeah. become more variable, and what does that mean? And I think in general, the answer is yes. And job changes, um, number yeah. of job changes in life. I mean, Yeah, though, you know, of course, some of that is endogenous because, if, you know, if you're the married couples, um, you can actually afford to change, you know, it's, you know, staying in the same job your whole life is not necessarily welfare enhancing. People did it because, 
you know, sure. they, they needed the job and no one else in their family was working. So it's a little hard to interpret some of this, right? What is good and what is bad. I mean, it's, it's, the whole problem of these well-being interpretations is yeah. separating out the involuntary choice from the, you know, what's welfare enhancing and what's, and of course the part of the problem is something that I do and something that you do that look absolutely identical, we would think about, we could think about quite differently. I and mean, it's just really hard from outside particularly to judge that. Um, if you look at the questionnaires on economic security, you know, one of the puzzles of even the late 90s and the 2000s when you have these economic expansions is that people feel less secure. And, um, you know, there's a discussion about, you know, the political scientists probably know this discussion better than I do, sort of why is that? And I think, and, and, and the rising variance in income does not seem to fully explain it. Um, it um, you know, it may be, um, you know, it could simply be rising social expectations about what you're supposed to do for your kids, or you know, sort of the comparison to the Joneses in some senses. You look at people who are better off, and or, you know, they keep pulling further and further ahead. And so, even though you're doing more for your kids than you ever expected, you still feel behind relative to what your neighbor's doing, who's who's better. And or, or you know, or it could be just a, a much more competitive economy with merit pay being paid out there, and you know, performance is going to matter more. And there's sort of less, you know, less guarantee that you're going to get three percent increase every year, regardless of what you do. Um, but. Um, uh, you know, I guess I say I mean, there, there needs to be a discussion in the paper on some of these sort of larger issues around what else matters for well-being. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is an extra yeah. dimension in which yeah. skill adds to your ability to yeah. move yeah. to yeah. education. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the back. Uh, hi. So I have two quick kind of measurement uh, mm -hmm. issues slash comments. One is um, to what degree has immigration uh, played a role in inequality, and could we could we be sort of um, importing inequality through immigration in a kind of uh, mechanical way. Uh, and two is, and this is going to be really a lot harder to measure, mm -hmm. I think, um, how about the fact that so labor force participation has gone down, particularly among low-skilled men, could they be substituting black market uh, mm -hmm. income and that mm -hmm. we're really not getting it, mm -hmm. a lot of consumption. Yeah. So um, the immigration question is an interesting one. And th there's a footnote in the paper at some point where I'm talking about uh, the fact that um, less skilled workers in terms of wages are much worse off, but they're a declining share of the population. And this footnote says, you know, in 1979, you would have expected the decline in less skilled workers to have occurred much more rapidly than it did for two reasons. One is that your education levels didn't continue to increase as fast as they had been. So there's sort of a stalling out of high school graduation and college graduation. So, so you, you didn't see as fast a decline in the less skilled workforce as you would have expected. And the second is immigration, because we renewed the group of less skilled workers at a higher rate than we thought we were going to as, as, as immigration increased. And there's no question that that added to widening inequality. I don't have an estimate of that in the data. Partly in 1979, it's hard to get at that in the data. I'd have to go to a different data source to try to look at that. And I don't know anyone who's made that estimate. I, I, you sort of got to go to the census, I guess, and Debbie look Reed, at it. Yeah, Debbie Reed, Pittsburgh, uh, yeah. California, anyway. OK, I'll, I'll go look that up. 80% um, of the rise of yeah. inequality in the 80s was caused in California. In California. Immigration by yeah. studies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would expect in a couple of states it was quite important, <coughs> probably less important in, at a more national level. But um, the informal economy is very important. It's one of the reasons why I think um, expanding the earned income tax credit to um, um, individuals who don't have kids is quite important. Um, one of the things that happened when you expanded the income tax credit for single moms, as it turns out, it shouldn't be a surprise if you know anything about welfare levels, there were a good number of women who were working while they were on welfare. They didn't tell anyone they were working. They were working in informal jobs. It was not being publicly reported. Well, once the EITC comes out, you know, you have to work in a public, you know, sort of a publicly reported above ground economy job in order to get the EITC. And if you can get an additional two to three to four thousand dollars a year, it's worth it to do it. Um, so there's sort of this so-called smoke out effect of women reporting their jobs and moving into the overground economy, the above-ground economy, because of the presence of the EITC, and as well as some of the work reporting rules that went into effect. And you know, I would very much like to see something similar to that occurring with men. Now, the offsetting effect for men, and the question is, will the EITC be enough to offset this, is you've got a bunch of guys out there who are working in the informal economy because they're trying to avoid having their wages garnished because of child support stuff. And the way, you know, our child support system just creates so many disincentives for men to work or to report publicly their work or to work in the overground economy once you get to a certain point with regard to a pent up unpaid um, child support. And it's not that these guys shouldn't pay, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, these guys should be paying child support, but you really don't want to drive them out of the labor market entirely or entirely into the underground economy. And we, we do that by the way we deal with the rearages right now. 
And um, you know, so I, I think part of the issue for the informal economy is something like an EITC. Part of the issue is we really do have to go back and look at the way we handle child support things. Steve. Yes. Oh, so I, I just wanted to, to push you a little bit more mm -hmm. on the on the welfare reform issue mm -hmm. and and to uh, I guess circle back to a suggestion that Leah had. had. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what perhaps is the sort of most surprising empirical finding mm -hmm. is the growth in income at the bottom of the, the earnings distribution, or bottom, not the earnings distribution, but the household mm -hmm. income distribution. And, you know, while, while clearly labor force participation pay for women are, mm -hmm. are rising through 1990 mm -hmm. among all groups, mm -hmm. I don't. I couldn't imagine that it's the women married to high-skilled men that are pushing up the income at the bottom of that yeah. tail. Yeah. So it, it might it might be useful just to just take one additional year, like 1990, mm -hmm. and see whether or not you know the the sort of 50-10 ratio yeah. in 90 yeah. is is yeah. higher or lower yeah. than the 50-10 ratio yeah. in 80. And it might at least just as as a yeah. real simple cut. I mean, then you could just dismiss the whole thing if, yeah. if it's the same as it looks yeah. in two thousand seven, or maybe it would be worth further exploration. Yeah, yeah and I I don't have any doubts that I would see exactly what you suggest because there were, mm. you know, a substantial number of women who were, you know would have been on welfare and at very low income levels with high government income and no to um, or very low levels of earnings who you know by two thousand were in a very different situation. I mean, just as your chart mm -hmm. shows, and I've done those similar charts showing that you know that. You know, yes, women lost welfare benefits, but their gain in wages more than offset the change mm -hmm. in welfare. So you see, four to five thousand dollar average increases in income among is it's like low skilled women with a high school degree or less, right? And that's all the effect, the combination of welfare reform, the earned income tax credit shifts, and um, you know some of the other you know, the minimum wage increases that are going on there as well. And so, so the timing of how these things are shifting tells you something. Is that the shift for the less skilled women has to all be in the '90s. The shift for the more skilled women actually speed, you know, it's, it's much stronger in the 80s and almost levels off by the late 90s and the 2000s. They, they sort of stabilize in terms of labor force participation in ours. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Just I want to build on something uh, Henry asked and also on, on something mm -hmm. that Jane asked. With regard to uh, uh, relative deprivation, um, mm -hmm. you might want to look at, uh, if it fits in, and certainly anybody yeah. in this room, uh, there is a, a, a kind of an explosion in the public health literature mm -hmm. uh, about the negative health effects on people who feel themselves to be at the bottom of pecking orders. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, making a fairly strong case uh, that actually relative deprivation matters mm -hmm. uh, in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, and then going to women's labor force participation, um, uh, Becky, you seem to be saying uh, that in the 70s and increasingly in the 80s and 90s, women are flooding into the workforce into paid work uh, because for two reasons. One, because you've got l very low uh, wage women going in because of uh, welfare reform and uh, EITC, uh, and then uh, most of the others coming in because of new opportunities for women. Uh, let me oh, yeah, suggest yeah. to you, let me just suggest that, yeah. that at least in the literature I've seen and the empirical work I've seen, the biggest yeah. explanation uh, is that women are coming in because men's wages are <coughs> dropping relatively. If you, if you assume that relative deprivation matters, there are expectations for how a middle class or lower middle class or working class uh, family should live, wants to live, expects to live. Uh, and as male wages level out, uh, or adjusted for inflation, actually in many cases decline, um, you get women moving into paid work in very, very large numbers, not because there are opportunities that were not available before. It's not professional women. Uh, it's not women who are uh, taking advantage of, of great uh, advantage, you know, great openings in, in uh, public consciousness about women in professions. No, it's women into uh, fairly menial jobs, uh, blue collar clerical jobs, uh, simply to earn more money for the family. So I'm going to half agree and half disagree with you. And I, I didn't want to say that this is all the decline of discrimination that lets women become doctors. Clearly, if you're talking about the very top end of these women married to high-income men with high educations, it's true. But for the vast majority of things, there's several things happening here. Declining male wages has some effect. But I have to say the research literature has had harder difficulties finding those effects on women's labor force participation than I would have expected. Um, the other thing that's happening is for all groups of women, except those at the very bottom, you're seeing real wage increases and you're seeing real wage increases um, because of experience increases. 
you know, as women work more, their wages go up, and then their value of staying in the workforce becomes higher. And at the same time, the other thing that's happening over this entire time period is, um, you know, the na you know, for 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 the longest time, whenever we look at women's wages or their labor force participation, you get big negative coefficients on the children that women have and whether or not they're married. Okay, and and you find that marriage, you know, reduces wages and kids reduce wages. The negative coefficients on marriage and wages declined steadily from the late 70s through the 80s through the 90s into the 2000s. So that by the middle of the 2000s, you have almost no negative effects of children on wages or labor force participation, except for very young children. And you have almost no negative effect, you know, the marriage has virtually no negative effect either. So that, um, you know, however it is that the labor market is dealing with women, maybe this is the availability of better childcare, the fact that bosses don't think women, you know, you know, let, you know deal differently with women who have kids. I mean, who knows what's going on here? Um, but women's wages are going up, and they're going up. Um, not just because at the top end you've got rising demand for more skilled women, but throughout the spectrum they're going up because women are acquiring more experience and because the things that seem to have had negative effects on their wages in the past no longer have as negative an effect. Um, and and you know, that's just driving this very steady, you know, you look at the, the changes in women's wages, that one graph that shows it over the skill distribution, and even high school grads or some college are seeing very large wage increases. And that's pulling, you know, the, the economics literature, which has some problems as to how it frames this, suggests that those wage increases are pulling up the labor force participation of women as much as anything else. And are those, yes, also endogenous with what's happening with the guys in the marriage? Um, yes, they are. Um, but, but all of that is happening at the same time. Uh, I should have said before that uh, I notice when people are, are want to say something and I write it down and I have a cue. So Mike Howard is next and then George White and then John Elwood. And if as you want to join in, just, you know, look at me, I'll get you. I've got two small points and a big one. Uh, the two small ones fit into the conversation that's been going on. Uh, the first is uh, this relative income versus um, main effect of income. Uh, uh, Bill Evans, uh, Susan Mayer, and I had a paper in the Kathy Neckerman Inequality Volume uh, that, where we used a decomposition that Henry invented uh, to, uh, to look at trends in happiness. Uh, and uh, the poor got less happy 1977 to 2002, and the affluent defined as the top one seventh, since the poor were roughly the bottom one seventh of the income distribution, looking at comparing the top one seventh, got happier over that over that period. And um, using Henry's decomposition, we figured that about between a quarter and a third of it was a relative income effect, but mostly it was the money. Mm -hmm. It was the money improved their morale. Um, and money does by happiness is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the Easterlin paradox. In every yeah. study you look at, yeah. the, the affluent are happier than the poor, but over time, income, in a, uh, income growth That's doesn't. That's the first time a sociologist ever told any of us that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. I don't mean to, I don't mean to uh, you know, belabor that point, but uh, you know. The other is, is just to underscore your, uh, your job's point with the Berkeley joke. When I first got here, there was a group called the Revolutionary Communist Party that went around doing broadsides on buildings, um, and, and one of their favorites was abolish wage slavery, and that the beacon movers down where Shattuck disappears, um, that somebody had come along and changed that and to, uh, put, by putting please at the beginning and, uh, or I won't get paid at the end. Please don't abolish wage slavery, I won't get paid. Uh, <laughs> because, the, you know, on, uh, they, they got it. Um, but the one, the big point I wanted to make is that I think in your, part of the reason you're not getting the leverage out of national trauma uh, that, that you want in part three of the paper is that the 80s recession wasn't really the treatment that the you know the Reagan recession was actually the outcome the political outcome of um, our reaction to the preceding crises the succession of oil crisis losing Vietnam hot Iranian hostages uh, Jimmy Carter malaise and the whole deal that resulted in a renegotiation of a lot of social contracts uh, from you know the the sort of Clark Kerr style uh, industrial relations one where the CEO's job is to manage the community the unions 
and the stockholders and sits in the middle of those and manages it to the shareholder value, uh, you know, raise the price next year or leave uh, um, kind of way of managing companies and other things that they really change, you know, the reason 77 becomes important is that, you know, those changes all occur in that period and yeah. then we elect Reagan and yeah. induce the recession and yeah. strangle but, inflation. But it turns out that the recession is actually not the main issue that's turning around well, that from was, a 50-year period of rising yeah. inequality to a period right. of, 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 of declining inequality to a period of rising inequality. It's, it's this whole series, of, as you say, of, of, of tax changes and redistributional changes and sort of a different mindset, well, which I, the recession may have fed into. Yeah, I guess I wasn't clear enough. What I'm trying to suggest is that it's that late 70s renegotiation of what's a company, what's a corporation, what does the, um, what does the employment contract look like? And that's not a, that that was a bit of a public policy change in the SEC, you know, changes uh, trading rules and stuff, but really what it was was a, Mm -hmm. a, a social contract that existed within the corporation and, you know, People, CEOs, got you know, corporate raiders got away with stuff that their predecessors wouldn't even have tried. Yeah. And deregulation, which of course starts under Jimmy Carter, is a big right. piece of that as well. Yeah. yeah. George, um, interesting discussion. I I learned a lot. Um, don't get much chance to uh, uh, get the latest on this subject. Um, as as it sounds like a paper, I, I have a suggestion about maybe framing. Uh, another component of, of what it sounds like the discussion would lead us to. Uh, and it sounds like the first component is to talk about the quantitative, the empirical data, that's, you know, which is really solid and, and very interesting. And then to go, uh, those macro topics that are in your qualitative aspect is good, and maybe some of the other things mm-hmm. that people put in are good. Um, and then the policy implications, I, I think you're going to buy, I, I agree with Lee, I think you're going to buy into that. And then the final one, it seems that like we've all talked around this, and there are just certain limitations to what you can talk about given the data and what you're focused on. And maybe some of those might be fully recognized. Uh, some things that, that I heard, you know, and you could talk about any three of them or six of them, it doesn't matter. But like, you know, the quality of life, well-being, uh, uh, impacts that, you know, it's hard to get at based on the kind of data that you're working with. Uh, government supplements, I mean, and, and their impact on disposable income, uh, and it, it can make a major difference uh, for people. Of course, the whole topic of the wealth disparities, uh, uh, you know, is not talked about, and, and that is really, I think, relative in a very macro sense because it uh, uh, leads to my fourth point about the psychology that people have you know, about this whole situation of disparity, uh, you know, is, was mentioned and, and is an important element that, you know, is, is, is out there. And then, the, you know, the, the credit access, which, you know, which contributes to, you know, uh, when things are going well, you have the, uh, extra money because you use your, your house as an ATM <laughs> machine and that kind of thing. Um, and people uh, have done a lot of things to offset these these inequalities, and so maybe some of those are you know relevant for, for for mentioning because when people recognize it, maybe they don't know the numbers, but they feel it in their gut, and so they there's a there's a response, and then and then finally um, you know the the whole topic which is is probably beyond your your coverage here. I don't know if the data is available. Is really about the the ethnic cohorts and 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 the uh, the implications for the for the different. Uh, uh, ethnic groups might be uh, su- substantial, especially you know w- with the uh, rising increase of institutionalization. I really like that point um, because it's it's a major uh, situation with I think you know over one million black men being in jail mm-hmm. you know in this country and, you know very substantial. So uh, anyway, those are some thoughts and and because those are topics potentially for future research as well by those interested in this area. Yeah, great. Thank you. Next, I have uh, John Elwood okay. and Melissa. Uh, this is not for your talk. This is for the next speaker uh, that is invited. But, it, but you do lead into it because your last section mm-hmm. is essentially the political economy uh, in order to change mm-hmm. the patterns that are out there. And um, there are these wonderful stylized facts out there. Um, it's really political science and the failure of political science 
to come up with the right analysis or analysis that convinced me. Uh, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal have this wonderful book uh, dealing with uh, votes in the House of Representatives uh, and scales of votes in the House of Representatives. And two things stick out in my mind. Number one, uh, we are in a highly polarized era. Okay, two, three things, that's mm -hmm. number one. And you see that in terms of uh, the politics in Washington today uh, for all the talk of bipartisanship, who cares? Zero Republican votes unless you give away half the world to two senators from Maine uh, <coughs> and one from Pennsylvania. Uh, number two, however, is we all assume this is new. And if you look at their time graph, it's absolutely symmetric over time. You have incredible uh, polarization at the beginning of the century. It then disappears right when you're talking about uh, the decline in terms of inequality in the 30s and particularly the 40s. And then you have this long period, you know, when you have uh, flat in terms of uh, inequality, in terms of change over time, and then starts rising again exactly at the same time the cheer series starts rising. So there, these two series just map one right over the other, but the causal model is really pretty weak. But they have two uh, things. One is that the, the, the uh, partisanship uh, is, uh, in terms of congressional votes, is absolutely correlated with the percentage of foreign-born and with the Gini coefficient. What does that mean? You know, that's, that's where it all falls apart, but those, mm -hmm. they have these two wonderful graphs and they got lots of money out of Russell Sage because of their wonderful graphs. Uh, and, and it's a surprising conclusion from them because they're not people who are sort of right. focused on concerns mm -hmm. about inequality. Mm -hmm. Right, no, they're sort of right wingers. They're conservatives. Yeah, yeah, conservatives, <laughs> but it, it's just there. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally think that the argument, they, the, uh, the model they have for immigrants makes more sense to me than the one they have for inequality but it's there. At the same time, political scientists don't find any of this in terms of polarization, in terms of uh, uh, the mass public. This is all an elite uh, pattern. And so when you're talking about what do we do about get, getting more funding for higher education or for schools in general, uh, how do you do that? Do you affect, I mean, everybody sort of has these very loose models the way we're talking around here in terms of changing attitudes of citizens, changing attitudes of activists, changing attitudes of public officials. And I don't think we have a very good set of models in terms of how these things work and the relationship between those three groups out there and how that in turn would lead to public policies that in fact would change the outcome uh, that you're interested in. Otherwise, whatever, the rest of you as economists around the table are really talking the way Quigley talked about uh, this tanker that's going through the ocean and you know, the, all the public policy stuff, who cares? Uh, you know, yeah. you're not going to move a little bit this way, a little bit that way, but these much bigger forces are driving. So when Lee says, what do you do about public policy, unless you can figure out some model in terms of uh, how um, you overcome uh, the polarization and, and the attitude structure, um, I don't know what you do. And so it seems to me that's the next thing that you need is you invite one of those guys or so, or David Brady who has another one, but I'm not as convinced with that one as I am with those three guys. Yeah. Uh, but these two both headed up teams in terms of this. But I don't think we've ever gotten very far. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys can answer that in terms of really explaining polarization. I mean, you know, Krugman, since he has newspaper columns, uh, his answer is, uh, I want the Great Depression. I want to wipe out the Republican Party. I want a you know, three-quarter Democratic uh, a vote majority in both houses of Congress, and then I can do something about it. So be careful what you wish for was my reaction. Well, no, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. in the case of California, right now, in terms of our budget, we had this before. Mm -hmm. And we had it in 1940, mm -hmm. where we had uh, seven years of terrible budget policy and kept building on massive, massive deficits. And we solved it. It was known as World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that what it takes? Uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know the answers to that. But, I mean, see, that's the real political economy problem that's sitting out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think they're, Henry, you work in this area, and Mike works in this area. Do you have good answers for this? Bob, uh, you have an answer. <laughs> I have answers that are not good. Yeah. No, yeah. Good, good answers in the sense of that you I, well, I, I heard five questions. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and three assertions. 
Yeah. And I, I'm not, I'm no, not, I'm not down I can tell you them. something about, I think, what happened in Mass Public to create, actually, that to help support this polarization among the elite. And a lot of it is the decline of the Democratic Party in the South the alignment of religious fundamentalism with the Republican Party and a new dimension of politics becoming even more prominent, which was the evangelical, religious, social issues kinds of dimension. And that's really clear. You see that very clearly in the data from the 70s onward. And yes, is there any connection to inequality? Yes, inequality with those adds forces. right on top of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an additive, not canceling process. Yeah. Uh, Everything that predicted the vote in the 1972 election predicted the vote in the 2008 election with a bigger coefficient. So every so major economic group, stuff still matters. Every major group is moving further apart, including affluent and poor, men and women, blacks and whites, churchgoers and stay at homers, uh, and uh, married people and not married people. All those things predicted in 72 with modest, you know, co coefficients, and now has a huge effect. The one that went away was South, non-South. Uh, it actually kind of flipped. But, but what, well, what is the causative theory uh, in terms of inequality uh, driving uh, evangelical or, uh, or other... <laughs> no, no, it doesn't uh, drive, it, it adds to, so it that it, to. they're the most uh, economically divided group in the country. The, 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 the truth is, a lot of white evangelicals should be Democrats if you look at their income. And they and and they voted for Clinton and they voted for Obama, but they did not vote for uh, so you're, so you're saying Moore. so you're saying that d despite inequality, right? Uh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. But right. But the but the effect of income on their vote, they're 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 more divided mm -hmm. than other major demographic groups. It just but it just adds. Thank you. Is evangelicals when you say they're more divided? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah evangelicals. White evangelicals. Yeah. Just yeah. Remember, black yeah. African Americans are yeah. evangelical too. Yeah. Many of them. Yeah. So getting back to John's, but they have different politics. But getting back to John's question, if I may, uh, you're not you're not suggesting, are you, that uh, somehow, even though there seems to be this correlation over the century, with regard to greater uh, lesser inequality in the middle part of the century, uh, leading to less polarization or, or correlated with less polarization in the early part of the century, more polarization. Latter part of the century, more polarization. You're not suggesting, are you, that the two ends of the century uh, resembled each other uh, in, uh, in, uh, in political ways, uh, that, there were, that, there were, that there are connections we can draw between uh, both the inequality and also the polarization at the first I, uh, I think at the first part time. of the century that the, that the polarization and its correlation with with income, at least, was driven by a populist get, you know, get on the idle rich, pr introduce these ninety percent progressive tax rates, uh, prove the uh, the constitutional amendment that allows it, and so on. And so it was a it was a movement run from the low end of the distribution to in to bring in social policies that were supported by their political supporters and resulted in these political right. outcomes. In the, in the last third of the, or, uh, quarter of the century, it was an affluent revolution that said get rid of regulation, cut taxes, cut marginal tax rates, flatten the tax rate, um, and uh, don't worry about the deficit. And that's what we got. I think there's also a, a religious issue. I think in the early part of the century, Christian socialism and much more progressive religious ideas were much more in vogue, and I think in the last half of the century they were much more conservative, evangelical kinds of sentiments in vogue, and that really helped the Republican Party a lot. It cross-pressured a lot of these Christian, white Christian evangelicals, well, because on the one hand they're not well off, but on the other hand they have very, very conservative social issue perspectives. And people who, who supported the income tax amendment also supported prohibition. So all those things, all those things are not. Right. I mean, insofar as the progressive movement and all those patterns happened, they happened after a part, uh, after a, a span of history that looked much more like the last twenty years. Right. I mean, I would say the progressive movement and all that stuff might look like the next twenty years. But, well, that's but what I would say. In fact, is I think that group might be right for that. To, was in response to the railroads and to all of the the. Right. I mean. Yeah, but you have to be a little bit careful here because the polarization had a different cleavage or something across the parties then than it did now, right? I mean, the Republican Party in, in the beginning of the 20th century had both the most conservative and the most liberal folks in it. 
and yet the, the polarization rates between the parties was as high then mm -hmm. as it is now. So I don't understand that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. at one level I follow what you're saying, but I, in terms yeah. of mapping it on to coalitions to get what education funding or whatever it is, uh, I mean, we have Republican governors turning down money to help their poor people. Yeah. You know, free money. Yeah. Something strange is going on out there, folks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and 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 if you if you're talking about the political economy to actually do things that will affect, uh, you know, your patterns, it seems mm -hmm. to me we have to figure yeah. that out. Yeah, and I, I think a piece of this, which you know, we haven't talked a lot about in this country because we haven't been to a point where it, it seemed, you know, clearly inequality was alone was not going to do it for us is the question of whether a long and deep recession where unemployment gets to 10% in aggregate, which means it goes up to 20% among those at the bottom, um, to what extent does that generate a level of social unrest that we haven't seen before, which opens up not only new political opportunities, but also creates real incentives for people in existing parties to try to cap that by doing redistributional programs purely as a way to stay in power and to, and to solve the unrest problem. And, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the economic destruction and collapse that we have been in the midst of at least puts that in the realm of possibility in a way that I don't think it's been in the United States for many, many years. I think we have a, a, a list of um, Melissa and Jean Bardak and Chris, did you have something? No? Uh, and then Jane Malden, and that may take us to the end, so I want to make sure that people have been waiting. And yeah, and I have to apologize, okay. but I've yeah. got an 11 o'clock that's, you know, sure. on the other side of Kansas. Uh, thank you, Mike. I'm sure I'll see you again soon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank yes. you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Melissa. Hi. I just wanted to mm -hmm. reemphasize Jane's point from mm -hmm. earlier, because I think it's so important mm -hmm. for this paper. Um, I would love to see a discussion of mm -hmm. whether well-being has been enhanced or not, given mm -hmm. income changes. But I think that's separate mm -hmm. in an important way from the accounting problem of just thinking about what it means in our numbers to have women move from how move household services mm -hmm. to the economy. And I think it's going to be important to account for that in some way. Um, if a woman goes to work and earns seven thousand dollars, but then she pays you know, her child care provider, $4,000, then you might have an effect on income that really is just showing up because of the transition from unpaid to paid. And I'm sure... Well, that's, that's a very real transition for the person who's getting 4000 someone who wasn't, you know, they, there is a real, you know, s s yeah. Well, what <laughs> we, I think more we money really care about economy. is disposable yeah. income, though. Yeah. And we're looking for, you know, like a real change in disposable income. And I think that masks you know, and ask that change or overstates that change. So if there's any way that you can account for that, I think that was an excellent point and it's, it's really important, especially since so much of this is driven by women's labor. Yeah, I have to say, I, I do think this is not, you know, one of the th things that happens, of course, and it's, it, you know, whatever you have higher incomes going up, and you have immigration at the same time, and you know one of the reasons you're allowing, you know, the, 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 is you're allowing immigration is because you have this demand for services. It, it's not that you're paying people who are there doing the work in the past. You've got a whole new population coming in doing the household services and doing the childcare that simply didn't exist in the 1960s and the 1970s. That you know, the, uh, you know, the the one striking occupational change among lower income women between the 1960s to the 1990s is that black women simply left any form of household service and you know just don't work in that at all under any circumstances and that you know and, and of course there was a huge expansion of household services but it was all filled by immigrant women um, so you know if you look at this as compared to whatever they were doing in their home country there's a very real income increase but then, then you get into the whole set of issues about their kids and who are left behind, and you know, it, it, it's, it's it's a hard thing to unpack. I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. It's a very important thing. And there's um, so much yeah. aside from yeah. domestic services yeah. that has become mm -hmm. entered the market, mm -hmm. and you know, and feels that people who were there before yeah. are working in. So. Yeah. Gene yeah. <coughs> Barta. Yeah, I I want to uh, just raise once again the, the issue that just came up so briefly and tangentially yesterday, which mm -hmm. is the question of mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, if we're going to be looking at, you know, sort of outcomes of something in the mm -hmm. equality world, first it would be interesting that, you know, their well-being would be one very important one, social mobility, social stability and, and, policy, and uh, you know, policy would be another kind of thing. But if you had to make a kind of a comparative ordered list of the things that might, in this general domain of distribution, 
either increase or decrease well-being, how would we rank a whole bunch of different things, which differ somewhat in terms of dynamic versus static, and also in terms mm -hmm. of reference mm -hmm. point? Obviously, relative equality or inequality, mm -hmm. uh, or relative equality, inequality, or absolute. Then mobility relative to expectations, relative to observing <laughs> others, relative to what you have what you have experienced, relative to what you would hope for your children, many dimensions that you would throw in here. And even though it might not be possible to, well, I, I don't know, since I'm not a, really a data person and don't know this field, I, I, I would very, be very curious to see how these things would, would, would rank, both in this country and elsewhere. And uh, my guess would be that the mobility issue would be rather more important than most of the others. And the one thing Jamie would, would add to the list is economic security. And I got no security, security of relative. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of the reference point issue and the dynamics versus the statics. And so rank relative to what goal? Well, I'm thinking about either experienced well-being or anticipated well-being. You know, something very mushy in the in the scheme of stuff. Or discontent. Hmm? Or discontent, resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, again, you, sort of, you think about <laughs> you think about the sort of dependent variable mm -hmm. list, which would include all the things we just said, mm -hmm. plus so you know social disruptive mm -hmm. potential for disruptiveness. Mm -hmm. I won't say revolution. Mm -hmm. Revolutions of rising expectations leading to real revolutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's just a yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I don't think that you can produce a completely persuasive listing of this. I mean, the question is always what, so what question do you want to ask? And depending on which question you ask, different ones of these rise to the top. And, and for different groups in the population at different times, different ones of these rise to the top. Um, you know, there's a huge literature on mobility that's growing rapidly. Um, there's no question that mobility in the U.S. actually doesn't look very good compared to our European developed neighbors, um, which surprises many people, but it's, it's clearly at least in, from the 1970s on, we seem to have lower mobility than they did. There's some evidence in earlier periods that we had higher mobility. Um, how much are people aware of that? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I don't, you know, we don't have a good series of, I, I think, public opinion questions on mobility that, that you can actually benchmark consistently over time. Um, we have better questions on happiness, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I start the paper actually by saying here are some of the reasons why you might care about inequality. Because you care about absolute well-being, you care about mobility, you care about civic participation and the social ways in which economic inequality might play itself out in other social forces. Um, I, I mean, I'd be interested in suggestions you have as to I, I, I'm not sure that I'm willing to sort of rank those and say, you know, this is first and that's second and this is third. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right, you were saying, that, yeah. you know, last time you were saying that mm -hmm. inequality is mm -hmm. the potential cause of, of lack of, of mobility mm -hmm. or lack of, but I, I'm flipping around and saying, well, mm -hmm. consider mobility independently. Of, of, mm -hmm. you know, what, how, does that, how does that fit into a psychological framing mm -hmm. about a sense of happiness or well being mm -hmm. or discontent or resentment? Or yeah. You could say, I mean, one view of this would be say, well, the current situation could be bad, but if you, but if mobility is all around you, and then that creates hope for yourself, for your children, and that quite offsets the static situation. Or you could say the reverse: things could be looking good statically, but if you feel a sense of despair and that your children will be worse off, and so forth, then. That's, that's I mean, my, my general reaction is that very deep recessions are actually very, very good for this because my, my certainly personal observation of the um, depression baby, the kids who grew up in that depression is, you know, you basically could sit on a rock between 1935 and 1965 and your income tripled, um, you know, so for at least the average white American, right? And all of these people sort of grew up, that, you know, feeling very poor, um, just had this enormous explosion in income and, you know, it ended up feeling quite good about, you know, very optimistic about opportunities and what was out there. and. Um, you know, that's, you know, if you, if you want to look, the, you know, the, the, a good five-year recession could recreate those opportunities so that everyone sort of feels good again once economic growth starts. But, you know, it's not clear to me that that's really what we want to do <laughs> in terms of creating um, um, optimism and a sense of mobility for the future. <laughs> Last question yeah. is from Jane or comment. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, 
I wanted to thank you in the middle of your talk mm -hmm. today of your emphasis on employment and unemployment mm -hmm. and over the years. That mm -hmm. is actually a lesson that I've learned from mm -hmm. you and that has stayed with me and I pass mm -hmm. on in my teaching because mm -hmm. you emphasize it all over the place. And I want to come back to it because especially in light of what you were just talking about, um, uh, it's a pessimistic view. Arguably, the middle of the century was an anomaly. Um, we came out of the recession, but really there was World War II, and people talk about World War II as if that gave us all an opportunity to build boats or something, which was in California, of course, important. But it also gave the United States the opportunity to make the rest of the world better off, but made the, um, doing well by doing good was absolutely what the United States was able to do for 20 years, 25 years, um, selling all kinds of good things and making a tremendous amount of money as a country. And uh, that will never come again. So there was essentially global dominance in innovation and marketing. And, and it created, arguably, it was the driver that you yourself have pointed mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. an opportunity for enormous widespread mm -hmm. employment gains, productive yeah. employment yeah. gains across yeah. the yeah. educational distribution. And at the same time, we sensibly invested some of that money in education mm -hmm. to a modest degree. But you know, other countries, made much more of an emphasis on e equality generating uh, social structures than the United States did. Admittedly, we had the GI Bill, but we mm -hmm. didn't get national health insurance. Mm -hmm. We didn't uh, expand our educational, well, we did expand our educational system, so that was mm -hmm. the big one, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So how to craft this in a world where we no longer can run, provide the bulk of you know, consumer goods is how to craft an anti, mm -hmm. a, a pro-equality agenda. I mean, you know, it's part of the issue is none, none of us wanted to see increasing equality occurring by huge wealth destruction and major recessions. I mean, this is sort of not, you know, it's, it's the, you know, say, I've said this on the gender wage differentials. I mean, for more skilled women, we've solved the gender wage differential or are solving it just the way we wanted. More skilled women's wages are rising faster than men's, but for less skilled women, we're lowering the gender wage differential because men's wages are falling to where women were. And, you know, and, and, you know you've, you've got this problem with inequality that there are good and bad ways to narrow inequality, right? And um, you know, there's some things we really would rather not do, even if it brought us better inequality. Right. And 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 like you know, so it's, it's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it, and particularly around the macroeconomic stuff. So it's an interesting set of questions. Unfortunately, we're running that experiment anyway. I think, but yeah. My thanks yeah. to the panelists, to Thank the you. audience, and especially yeah. to our guest Becky.